The tool assisted speedrun and superplay community is one of the most fascinating communities in all of speedrunning. By using emulator tools, they are able to create gameplay not feasible to be performed by humans. A lot of hard work and dedication is required for most of these high-level tasks, sometimes even requiring a team of individuals and collective research from all corners of the internet. Most of you are probably used to watching tasks of your favorite games to see what the theoretical limits are, whether the categories be any percent, 100 percent, or anything in between. But my personal favorites are the ones where the task authors think outside of the box and create unique and creative goals for solely entertainment purposes. On the website task videos, these often appear under the play around tag, or there are submissions that are created to get rejected on purpose and usually appear on April Fools. Additionally, there are even more that include a speed entertainment trade-off and will sacrifice speed in certain areas to make a more entertaining task overall. I'll include links to these pages in the description, but in today's video, I'd like to share some of the more entertaining ones I've stumbled across. I hope you all enjoy. Super Mario World, a game that is so glitch heavy that it's possible to be beaten in only 41 seconds. So it should be no surprise to anyone watching that the next task I talk about doesn't use any complex glitches at all, yet is still probably one of the more intricate tasks on this list. This task is titled Super Mario World Repeated Input, and the main objective of it is to beat the 11 exit warp route in Super Mario World while using the same inputs on each level. Conceptually, this task is pretty easy to understand, but very convoluted to execute since the levels are all structured so differently. So to explain this task, I want to talk about the main obstacles the task author, Master Dune, ran into while creating this route. The levels all start together on the overworld, so it only requires an A press to sync up each level at the same time. The only exception is Star World 3, which starts on a warp star instead of the actual level, so a right input is included to move it over. This is because the starting positions are wherever Mario ends up after beating the previous level. The first big obstacle in Master Dune's way was Star World 3. This is the only level which you don't start out by moving right. You instead have to hop on a cloud and move to the top of the level to get the key for the exit. Doing this detour all while avoiding the ghost circle in Donut Secret House and the large pits in Yoshi's Island 3 is a nightmare. Once Star World 3 is cleared, Mario then needs to collect a feather in Donut Plains 1. The cape you get with a feather is useful for its ability to descend slowly, making it possible to desync jumps from levels that aren't using the cape. The spin attack with the cape is also useful in the water levels, allowing Mario to attack any enemies that would otherwise need to be avoided. Going back to the run, if we look at Yoshi's Island 3, Master June chooses to take the underground route to avoid falling down the pits. Moving our focus to the Bowser boss fight, after getting two hits on the boss, Mario then needs to go left for a while in Donut Seeker House in order to progress. To do this, Master June preserves momentum in the air in Donut Seeker House to move left all while not moving in the other levels. This is done by pressing jump on the same frame Mario touches the ground to not lose any speed. If you look at the input display, you can see that left is barely inputted for the duration Mario is moving left other than in levels that require them. After the P-Switch in Donut Secret House is activated, it's onto one of the trickiest sections, Star World 4. This level has a lot of spots for the player to fall. In order to manage some of the other levels while not falling off in Star World 4, Master June goes in and out of the pipes to abuse their transition times. Once Mario has reached a safe spot in this level, it's time to catch up in some of the other levels that are falling a bit behind, which are Iggy's Castle and Front Door, because they both contain nets that prevented movement earlier on. Next, while avoiding falling in Yoshi's Island 3 and Star World 4, Mario finally reaches the auto scroller in Iggy's castle, and progress can be made in the other levels. At this point, some of the levels are starting to reach the end, but Master June can't beat them yet, since he has to clear them all at the same time. This means he has to stall for time in some levels, all while trying to complete the others. After the second Bowser phase is finished, Iggy needs to be defeated in his castle. This level is completed earlier than the other levels, due to the long cutscene that occurs after finishing it. Master June uses this cutscene time in the wait between the Bowser phases to catch up in Star World 2. You'll notice Mario turning left and right rapidly every frame, and this is used to preserve momentum while moving in the water levels, while not moving on the ground levels. It's also used to dodge the flames in the Bowser fight, and the ghosts in the Big Boo boss fight. Once Star World 2 is caught up, and the final Bowser phase is reached, Master June starts heading towards the goalposts in Yoshi's Island 2, 3, and 4, while also flying up to the keyhole in Donut Plains 1. While dodging Bowser, Mario lands the last hit on Big Boo. Master June then positions all of the Marios near their keyholes. Then he finishes the Bowser fight with the last two hits and enters all of the keyholes at the same time. Lastly, he moves Mario in front of the door while advancing through the title screen, and this completes the entire loop. There's a bit more to this task than what I explained, but at least I was able to go over the most interesting parts. If you want to learn even more, you should read through Master June's notes on task videos. This was Master June's 11th year of creating unique tasks for April Fool's Day, and I can't wait to see what he comes up with again next year. If you want to make a successful video on YouTube, you need to have two keywords. Minecraft, but. 
Type this into YouTube and there are hundreds of videos with millions of views. Minecraft, but every enchant level is 1 million. Minecraft, but everything is 10 times bigger. You get the point. However, one of the most interesting challenge runs I've ever seen is to beat the game without left click. This means we can't attack or break anything. So how is something like this even possible? Well, this was performed by a talented tasser named Circuit, and they completed this challenge on version 1.12.2 on set seed with glitches. Everything seen in real time is extremely quick, so I'll be slowing down the video at parts to explain what's going on. The run starts out by running to a small cave in the desert where the creeper and enderman spawned in. Since we cannot use left click, we'll have to obtain the ender pearls by other means of killing, the fastest being explosive damage. What's tricky is that the creeper can only do enough damage to kill the enderman if they're on top of the same block. Otherwise their hitboxes would repel each other and stop that from happening. For this run to be efficient, we'll need two pearls, and since endermen only have a 50% chance of dropping one, a ground duplication glitch is performed, which is done by hitting escape to save the world, hitting alt F4, and then reloading the world. I'll point out that all loads are cut out from the run, including saving and quitting, and alt F4ing. The spot of the explosion also gives us sand and flint, which will be used in a bit. Next we'll need a bow to kill blazes, but the only way to get a bow from the skeleton is to be responsible for the kill. To do this, we'll throw a pearl at it, registering as us hurting it. The second creeper will blow up the skeleton, and there's the bow. The next thing is to throw a pearl towards a village that's nearby, but then set the render distance really small so that the pearl unloads. This is so we can multitask by getting additional sand by having a third creeper blow up this area, and then set the render distance to how we had it originally to teleport when we're ready. Now we get to the blacksmith and use a chest dupe technique to get a large amount of obsidian and sand. The way items are clicked in the chest is by shift right clicking, which has the same effect as shift left click. We then build the nether portal, craft flint and steel, smelt the sand into glass, and then we go. In the nether we need to kill one blaze and one gas, and then we're out. We build an additional portal, and this spot allows us to spawn inside the stronghold. This chest allows us to dupe a bunch of pearls, blaze rods, and glass. Now we need a crafting table. So we head to the library and have a creeper blow up the shelf we're standing on so we can get planks. Wood is obtained here since luring a creeper to the village would take too long. From here we go to the portal room and craft the end crystal, which will be used to skip the ender dragon fight. Placing it as fast as possible once spawned in the end will cause the ender dragon to deload and the end portal to be active. Then after chucking a few pearls to the portal, we complete Minecraft with no left click in 1 minute and 52 seconds. While the Generation 1 Pokemon games are a staple of the original Game Boy, they aren't necessarily coded very well and are riddled with exploits and glitches that exist all over the place. One such glitch that will be relevant for the next task we'll be discussing is performed by restarting the game shortly after initiating a save. This will corrupt the number of Pokemon in the party from 0 to 255. Since the max number of Pokemon you're meant to hold is 6, all Pokemon listed after the 6th slot point to different areas in memory. By using both the Pokemon list and item bag, it's possible to initiate arbitrary code execution to make the console do things that were never intended to be done by the user. So with Ace, the tasking potential is no longer limited by the constraints of the game, but what can be achieved on the Game Boy Color hardware. Such as being able to make the console play a MIDI track of My Little Pony, or print out the digits of Pi with dancing Pi symbols on the screen. These two tasks are what would then inspire one of the most creative tasks I've ever seen using this Ace exploit by Mr. Wint. This Tasa's Ace Exploit requires three stages. It first starts out in Pokemon Yellow, and right away they activate the Ace Exploit I referenced before by swapping Pokemon and discarding or using items. By doing this, they write a short program in RAM that allows the console to read joypad inputs to write code. This is useful because inputting joypad inputs is a hell of a lot quicker than manually moving Pokemon and items around. Because the Game Boy Color is such a low level of computing, there's no real difference between code and data. It's all just strings of zeros and ones. So if you can get this Game Boy to store this joypad data, it's also possible to get it to execute these zeros and ones as a program. In this case, a video and audio player. The video player can then take more button inputs to change out sprites, palettes, and play audio. Basically, none of what you'll be seeing on screen is actual gameplay, but instead the video and audio players constantly reading joypad inputs to display what you see on screen. Now that we have this explanation out of the way, what happens next is truly remarkable. First Ash gets warped straight to the Hall of Fame, but unfortunately the princess is in another castle. What a bummer. Then Pokemon Gold boots up, and after loading the save, we're now playing Pokemon Crystal, and run into an encounter with a shiny Celebi, battling it with a shiny Mew. The player throws his only Pokeball, and luckily catches it first try. He then heads into the Goldenrod Pokemon Center, where we meet a young boy playing Tetris, and he shows off some of his moves.
After exiting the Pokemon Center, we end up outside the home in Link's Awakening, dodging the Chain Chomp, and head into the house, which loads back into Pokemon Crystal. He then walks upstairs into the Pokemon Yellow Bedroom so Ash can play Super Mario Bros on his NES. And while he's playing the game, every time Mario hits a block, the game progressively gets faster. After leaving the bedroom, Ash is back in the Hall of Fame, except this time Professor Oak turns out to be GLaDOS from Portal in Disguise. Then, after the fade out, this happens. How does he do that? When the credits start playing, the ace exploit has officially ended and the game has returned to normal, meaning you could resume playing it as if nothing happened at all, which is a fantastic touch to add from Mr. Wind. Just the fact that all this was even possible by playing Pokemon Yellow on a Game Boy Color is amazing. And I'm sure it still has many of you wondering, How does he do that? Those guys are dorks. Next up is an adventure mode run from Super Smash Bros. Melee, and the challenge is to not jump a single time. Samus is a perfect character for this concept, and here's why. The most important thing that's used here is her rising grapple. This is performed by air dodging upwards into using her air grab. The air dodge gives the perfect amount of momentum needed to allow Samus to gain a lot of height pretty fast, and the amount of momentum doesn't stop since the air dodge is cancelled. Of course, since air dodges can only be done in the air, we can use bombs or duck through platforms to get airborne. This tech is seen a lot during the Brinstar escape shaft. While at first glance it looks like Samus is jumping and then using her air grab, I can assure you she's not really jumping. This is actually a concern in the comment section of the author's video, but at the end of each level, one of the bonuses that's earned is cement shoes, which can only be earned by not jumping. So hopefully that's enough proof. The next strat used is damage boosting, the knockback being manipulated using DI and SDI, which basically means adjusting knockback angle and position after being hit by an attack respectively. The author wanted to get as many SDI inputs as possible, while also being as precise as they could get with the DI trajectory. This is seen a lot in the Mario level, Icicle Mountain, and F-Zero. The other main strat used is Super Wave Dashing to cover a large amount of horizontal distance quickly, because as you know, this is still a speedrun. The Super Wave Dash is a frame-perfect physics exploit that can only be performed by Samus. And if a player performs it right, they'll zoom across the map. In order to do this, a player has to drop a bomb, and as Samus is hitting the ground, hit the opposite direction desired on the 41st frame, and then hit the direction desired on the 42nd frame. Some other highlights of this run include Samus winning by doing absolutely nothing, <laughs> Captain Falcon getting completely shut down, <laughs> and Zelda getting absolutely destroyed. These examples are just tip of the iceberg, so I recommend checking out the full video if you would like to see all the crazy strats. A long time ago, there was a trick discovered in The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time that allows the player to enter loading zones that are otherwise blocked by doors. I'm gonna figure out how to get to this door. This will be so useful in any percent can't open any doors. I think it's this frame. Oh! Yes, dude! <laughs> this was found by Kida and his friends, and after their discovery, they began discussing what a speedrun category with this trick would look like. One where you don't open a single door. This discovery created the any percent no doors run, a meme speedrun dedicated to not opening a single door in Ocarina of Time whatsoever. But then a tasser named Taylor, with the help of the No Doors Collective, created an all dungeon no doors task. Opening a door refers to multiple in-game events, with the most obvious being standing in front of a door and pressing A. Additionally, doors that are opened by actions other than an A press, such as the door of time, are also disallowed. This goal might seem silly, but it requires an incredible amount of glitches and abusing the game in very specific ways to achieve this. Now since this is a two hour long task, and because there's so much that goes on, I'll only highlight the key points, but I'll have some notes in the description which explains everything in more detail, as well as the commentated video by ZFG and Taylor. The first major sequence break is skipping the door of time which allows Child Link to obtain the Master Sword. There's a tiny crack between the door and the wall that Link can jump through with a particular setup that lets him clip through the door and reach the back room. 
For the first dungeon, Dodongo's Cavern, we perform a mega flip clip into the Dodongo's head while it's close. Once we're out of bounds, we perform an infinite sword glitch off a of bomb, so Link can bomb hover into the boss loading zone in the room behind it, which incidentally also skips the door that leads to Dodongo's boss room. During a later section, we obtain Ferora's Wind, which will be used plenty of times throughout the task. For Jabu's dungeon, this can normally only be accessed by Child Link, but the loading zone for Jabu still exists, as it's part of the map itself. However, it was covered with ice to prevent Adult Link from being able to trigger it. But if you clip inside of it, you can still activate the loading zone. Once inside, we cast Ferora's Wind, and we'll be back to fight Baronade. In the same section of the task, we seal Epona, which will be used later. A super slide teleport is performed off this bush to clip into the ground and swim into the Water Temple loading zone. We won't be completing Water Temple just yet, but rather we perform a Void Warp back to Jabu. The whole point of going into Water Temple was to be able to use Ferora's Wind since it can't be used outside of dungeons. Also right before Jabu, we use a light arrow cutscene to perform a reverse bottle adventure as Adult Link, which makes it possible to finish the dungeon in the first place. Up next is the Forest Temple, and we hookshot jump off Epona to do a Ferora's Wind Void Warp which spawns Link in the Forest Temple. After Forest Temple, we perform another bomb hopper through the ceiling and across the room transition to right in front of the boss door collision, which is where we fight Morpha back at the Water Temple. If you jump slash at the door from high enough while holding forward, you simply clip into it. Next is the Shadow Temple boss key skip, which uses a Z target ledge clip and damage boost. This requires very complex movement to get to the boss room door and is one of the cooler visuals of the task. Jack says Ganon for the first time, we bomb hover out of bounds and then pass the door to the trial's room, to where trial skip is performed. Then we hookshot clip out of bounds and hover to the Ganon door fight, using a bit of geometry available to perform reverse bottle adventure halfway through. Afterwards, we void warp with Prelude to load the back room of the Temple of Time with coordinates from the Tower Collapse entrance, which allows Link to put away the Master Sword without worrying about the Door of Time. We skip the Door of Time once again and perform two more Z-Target ledge clips in the section, once to get into Darunia's room, and another to get into the ground below Favalgia's boss room door. What follows this is a bomb hover into the door loading zone from below it. After defeating Volvagia, we perform the Ocarina items glitch to delay the blue warp timer so we can break out early, and then perform an acute angle clip behind the boss door to wrong warp into Ganon's castle. Once again, we void warp with Prelude to load the back room of the Temple of Time and perform Door of Time skip again. Now it's time for the first part of Spirit Temple, and this is where we do something called Spirit Hover, which is just the infinite sword glitch plus bomb hovering. This allows us to skip going through the dungeon in order to obtain the mirror shield and avoid a lot of doors in the process. Now we need to perform the spirit boss key skip, and this involves similar complex movement, just like in the Shadow Temple. It involves navigating through unloaded rooms by weird shotting off a of two to hookshot a hookable surface and bomb hovering out of bounds. Once the skip is done, we perform another hookshot clip and then a big bomb hover to the upper room. Before completing Spirit Temple, we'll complete Deku Tree, which is done by skipping this room transition so the Deku Tree room doesn't load. An actor in the room is the Deku Tree's mouth and since it is not loaded, allows you to simply walk into the deco tree. After this fight, we'll be wrong warping to the castle escape section once more by loading the Kokiri Emerald cutscene combined with the entrance of the deco tree from Goma's room. Going back to the spirit temple, we need a way to access Winrova, but there's no way to load the room and the boss without opening the door. If you clip past the door, you'll just be in an unloaded room because opening the door is what actually initiates loading the room. So to get around this, we collect a Gold Skeleton token with the help of a 2 explosion. This stores the token's freezing abilities, and if you hookshot something in the frame you reactivated by looking at it, it'll cause a hookshot jump. We use this to clip into the Twin Rova boss room area, then set Ferora's Wind on B. Then we use Ocarina items to warp out after. This is where another Ferora's Wind Void Warp is performed by using Death Hold Dive in Goron City. Since Goron City's primary room number is 3, and the Twin Rova primary boss room is also 3, the proper room loads when you void warp in. The coordinates of the entrance to Goron City from the Death Mountain Trail puts Link just inside the bounds of the Twin Rova room. After Twin Rova is beaten, that means all of the dungeons are finally completed. Defeating Ganon isn't required for the all dungeon speedrun since credits warp is an option, but it didn't feel right to end the task off there, so they tie off some loose ends first, and then he's finally defeated. Hey guys, we have one more task to show you, but before doing so, if you enjoyed the video up to this point, consider dropping a like to show support. Also after this video, if you're looking to watch even more speedrunning content, be sure to check out my second channel, Easyscape Speedruns. And back to the rest of the video. If you've ever watched games on Quick Live, you've probably seen the task plot block, 
which is a showcase of some really cool runs that various tasters spent countless hours making, all while using the TaskBot hardware to execute inputs on real hardware. During AGDQ 2016, Brain Age was one of the games featured, and it's actually the most viewed speedrun on the GDQ YouTube channel. The game itself has a set of mini games that are designed to help improve one's mental processes, with the most popular mini game being Calculations X20 and 100. It's pretty much just arithmetic problems, and the goal is to complete all of them as fast as possible. So, how could the task of this be interesting? Well, it's possible to manipulate the game's optical character recognition, which is referred to as recon. A basic way to do this is to draw an image starting from a location that the game doesn't recognize, causing it to ignore the image, and then draw the actual answer out of bounds. But this is considered cheap, so this run was actually designed in a way to actually trick the game into thinking that the image is a number. There are four basic concepts as to how this works. Segments, models, key points, and edges. Segments are lines drawn without interruption. Every single input of a segment is a key point, and the start and end of a segment are special kinds of key points which are edges. The combination of key points and edges assemble to create what is called a model, which is then assigned to a specific number based on the model and given an answer. The game tries to detect a reasonably sized model from a drawing and also uses something called bias as a recovery mechanic that allows very skewed drawings to be successfully recon as a correct answer. In a single digit answer where there are multiple models with varying sizes, the game will prioritize the model with the right answer. This is just a basic explanation as to how this works, so I'll have the task videos post linked in the description, which explains everything in more detail. Another task that shares a manipulation concept like in Brain Age is Family Feud, where the author abuses the word recognition system. Compared to Brain Age, this manipulation is a lot more simple. The game doesn't check to see if you spelled an answer correctly, but rather that all the characters of a correct answer are in the right order. So for example, the game asks you to name an occupation that starts with the letter B. An acceptable answer would be Baker, However, you could type out, I bathe Keanu Reeves. All letters of Baker are in sequential order. If the game asks you to name a piece of clothing that leaves a mark when you take it off, an acceptable answer is bra, but abracadabra I win is obviously correct too. He is an evil genius, the task's author, demolishes the Hall family, and the top comment for the video says it all. The way it goes through the halls for a reaction every round, the looks on their faces, the sound of the music where all but the bass has been muted, zero dollars cash total, the fact that it just hangs there for 10 seconds every time is absolutely beautiful. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed today's video. I was also going to include the Super Mario 64 minimum A press challenge, but luckily for you guys, the entire history of the challenge is being covered by Bismuth in a five part series, so I recommend checking that out if you want to learn more. Or you can just check out either of Pond and Coex channels. Lastly, I want to give a huge thanks to our Patreon backers. Thank you so much for supporting our content. Beescape and myself worked really hard to put this video together, and it was a lot of fun to make. Anyways guys, that's pretty much all I have to say. Subscribe for more speedrunning related content, and as always, I hope you all have a beautiful life.